Good afternoon and welcome to this, our third and final webinar in our private law series. Um, I'm Sean Smith, this is Catherine Howells, and we're both barristers in the private law group here at 42BR. Um, we are going to do the usual things today. So the webinar is going to be recorded. It'll be available on the Chamber's YouTube channel after today, if you need it. Uh, questions, please put any in the Q&A box. And if we have time, we'll get to those at the end of the session or we'll follow up by email. And there will also be a link for the recording feedback form uh, will be sent out by email to you too. So let's start. Um, nice, non-controversial topic to start with, but one that seems to be more and more a feature um, in private law cases, certainly the ones that um, I'm dealing with. Um, properly describing it now uh, as cases involving alienating behaviour, placing emphasis on the fact that um, it's the actions of the parent um, that are harmful and results in the harm to the child and need to be um, focused on. And Rizzi places that emphasis um, clearly um, on the fact that these are allegations of harmful behaviour and not, as we know, um, any sort of condition um, present in the child um, as was previously um, featured in the case law years ago. So uh, we have, where we have allegations of alienating behaviour, like any allegation of harmful behaviour, domestic abuse, or other sorts of um, abuse, it's a question of fact for the court to decide. Um, and that gives us our clear pathway, really, of how to deal with these cases. And it's the pathway that is adopted, um, as you'll see when we come into discussing the draft Family Justice Council guidance um, that is proffered by them. Um, Fact-finding hearing ought to be um, the step to take where there is sufficient evidence um, that there may be alienating um, behaviours. So um, that makes clear that we should be dealing with the facts first and any sort of psychological or expert assessment of the child ought to come firmly um, after the facts are known. Um, that's really just to give the background and, and that's been really firmly established in the case law um, leading up really to what we're dealing with in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to discuss the approach um, of Mrs Justice Leaven in the case of uh, Warwickshire County Council. Um, in this case, um, she considers um, the guidance given in RE-S, Parental Alienation Cult. Um, that is um, likely familiar um, to most of you, but the emphasis there on the fact that where the court has made findings of parental alienation, the obligation on the court is to respond with exceptional diligence and take whatever effective measures are available. Um, and that um, placed that firm obligation on the court to really take steps to change the situation um, for the child. So in this case, it was a private law case initially ended up being public law case because of the harm being caused um, as a result of alienating behaviours. There was uh, findings made um, of those um, behaviours and the harm to the child. And the child had been removed um, from the care of the mother. And Mrs Justice Leavham, dealing with this competent young person, he very much wanted to go home to the mother who had the findings made against her, uh, really describes in her judgments in two of them, one an interim one where she returned the child to the mother's care and another one um, dealing with the final um, outcome. Um, really dealing with the tension between that um, enjoinder from Ries on the court to be forceful and um, take action in order to... Uh, move matters and change matters, a call for judicial resolve, um, as it was called, and the wishes and feelings of the child and the harm and that may be caused to the child by taking those steps. And what she said um, 
was that she accepted that she, the court might be accused of a lack of resolve. But in some cases, there's no solution to a problem, only a choice between two not good outcomes and the need to choose the least worst outcome. And what might be characterised as choosing the course which is less stressful for the child could alternatively be described as taking into account and giving appropriate weight to the child's wishes and feelings. So this is a case that comes uh, uh, and falls on the other side of that balance in determining um, what is the right outcome for the child. And she, in, in the second of her um, the judgments, uh, really considers whether the label of parental alienation is helpful at all um, in this sort of case. And she felt that it had been particularly unhelpful um, for this family, that it had embedded the conflict um, and given the sense to um, one parent that they were right and justified and the other parent um, that they were wrong. And all parties, not just the the father who was bringing the application, indeed supported by the local authority and the guardian at times, um, had been what she described at some points as being a loss of humanity in terms of um, understanding those relationships um, between the different family members. Um, so it's a really interesting case um, to read. It doesn't um, change uh, the authoritative nature um, of RIES and the importance of um, taking action in these cases. But just in this case, it was a different action that she decided was in the child's best interest, um, taking into account all of uh, the um, aspects in the welfare checklist. So it, it's certainly a good one to read. Thank you. Um, so that leads us rather neatly onto the 2024 case of RE-T. Um, this was a judgment of Mrs Justice Arbuthnot. Um, there were previous findings in this case that the mother had alienated the children against the father um, and both children were now strongly opposed to contact. Um, the court in this case considered the case law on extending child arrangements beyond the age of 16, um, noting that many of the case law examples are rather unhelpfully in this case involving children um, with additional needs. The courts in the end determined that the order would only last until the youngest was 16, and that was in light of his strong wishes and feelings. Um, again, we can see um, the kind of balancing that Sean was talking about in that previous case. Um, and the decision was reached on the basis that the judge was sceptical about how an order could be made to work beyond the age of 16 in light of those strong wishes and feelings. I've also included a quotation on the slide um, from the very final paragraph of the judgment in this case, um, as it does eloquently sum up the difficulties that the court faced during this litigation. And it does note that this case is by no means unique. Um, there's also on this slide reference to the Family Justice Council consultation on the draft guidance on responding to allegations of alienating behaviour. Um, this consultation was opened um, back in August 2023. It had been hoped that the guidance would be published um, during the course of 2023. However, due to the volume of submissions received, they are now hoping to publish their guidance in the autumn of this year. So uh, watch this space for that. The um, guidance will have a focus on how parental alienation um, allegations are case managed within private law proceedings, such as the use of expert evidence and how allegations are responded to. Um, there's also, you can see at the bottom of that slide, the case of RE A and B. Um, back from 2023. Um, this was a fact finding in a case uh, described by the court as a long and tortuous case of parental alienation. Um, it contains a very help helpful summary of the law um, and an example of the court's approach um, to cases of parental alienation. Um, and if you want to go and find that summary, it's at paragraphs 39 to 49 of the judgment. Um, obviously, it's a long portion to have included within the slides for this uh, webinar. Um, in the case of RE-A and B, the findings of parental, parental alienation sought by the father against the mother were all made out. 
and the judge was complimentary of the work that had been done with the family by the professionals in this case. Thank you. Um, move on now to um, to a different topic as we tour through um, the case law. Um, child arrangements now, shared lives with audits. Um, this is a judgment from Mr Justice Williams, um, LKM and MPM from 2023. And it really is uh, a one-stop shop if you have a case where you're looking at um, whether to make a shared residence order, because it gives um, an excellent summary um, of the state of the law as it stands at the moment. Um, emphasis, as you can see in that very first paragraph on the paramountcy um, of the welfare of the child, um, but then going on to look at um, various aspects that have come from different parts of the case law that are important um, and um, to emphasise uh, that both parents equal in the eyes of the law, um, that um, there needs to be a positive indicator that the child's welfare would be served by a shared lives with order. Um, but it may be appropriate where it provides um, a confirmation of the factual reality of the child's life um, and then goes on to consider, um, obviously, that it may be appropriate because it benefits the child um, psychologically and indeed uh, may insist in holding the balance um, between the parents. I won't go through each one of those factors, um, but, but it's an exceptionally helpful um, summary. The case itself um, was not one in which a shared residence order um, was made, but it is an interesting case nonetheless. Um, findings of domestic abuse had been made. Um, the father had made some progress following that and was having some unsupervised contact. Um, but Mr Justice Williams found that there was no prospect um, of the parents co-parenting um, and managing um, the, the um, children in a collaborative way. There was far too much distrust um, and progress really needed to be made by the father engaging with therapy uh, and a number of steps. And so um, a order was made uh, for the children to live with their mother, spend time with their father, um, that reflected the reality, um, but also um, really addressed the fact that the mother's need to have a, a soul lives with order in this case. And indeed, um, the order went further than that, was appealed, but unsuccessfully, um, and a schedule was drawn up to make clear what aspects of parental responsibility would fall into the mother's decision-making on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there wouldn't have to be um, lots of liaison between the parents, which was likely to cause um, lots of acrimony and disagreement and, and really cause arguments where there didn't need to be any. Um, so that's enabled her to sort of move forward making the day-to-day -day decisions um, without worrying about communicating with the father. Um, wasn't a long-term order. It was intended to be um, as an interim order, although there's no reason why it couldn't have been. Um, it was anticipated that any um, big ticket items would have to come back to court um, at that stage. That just gives an example of how parental responsibility can be managed um, in cases which are high conflict and where it's appropriate to provide some measure of protection. And we'll come on to... Um, some of the other cases where those sorts of approaches um, might be appropriate um, in a short while. Thank you. Um, so next up, we are tackling special guardianship orders and we're looking at the case of AB and XX and another. Um, and this is a rather unusual and in my opinion, quite interesting case. Um, the maternal uncle, applied for a special guardianship order to enable him to collect the children from school when neither parent is available to do so um, and to look after them. Um, he required permission for leave to be able to make this application and that um, permission was refused. Um, the application was found to be an abuse of the SGO jurisdiction and the judge was clear that this application should never have been brought. 
Um, it was Mrs. Justice Leaven who commented that such arrangements um, such as these, collecting children from school and looking after them, um, are very common in the UK. And it would be a waste of court and local authority resources to allow this application to proceed on this basis, when all that was really needed was for the parents to write to school setting out their permission. Um, it was also interesting to note in this case that it emerged on questioning from the judge um, of the maternal uncle and of the mother, that the real reason for the application was to present evidence to the Home Office to support the maternal uncle's immigration case. Um, and then we have the case of T&T, &T, um, which is an application which was an application for temporary removal to a non-Hague country. In this case, it was an application by the mother to take the child who was then aged five to Pakistan for Christmas. Um, for those of you who don't know, Pakistan has signed the Hague Convention, but its accession is yet to be accepted by the UK, such that it is not yet in force between the two countries. Um, this case does contain a helpful summary of the relevant law applicable to temporary removal to a non-Hague country, the leading authority being RE-R, um, and I've included the citation there, it's a 2013 case. Um, the overriding consideration for the court will be the best interests of the child, where there is some risk of abduction and an obvious detriment to the child if that risk were to materialise, the court has to be positively satisfied that the advantages to the child of her visiting that country outweigh the risks to her welfare, which the visit will entail. Um, the court in these types of cases will need to investigate what safeguards can be put in place to minimise the risk of retention and to secure the child's return. In most cases, but not all, the, the court did emphasise expert evidence as to appropriate safeguards will be needed. <clears throat> um, the application in this instant case was refused as the court found that the contact arrangements uh, were still very new and needed more time to settle down. Um, if the child went to Pakistan, she was, would also lose, lose out on spending a week in the Christmas holidays with the father. Um, the court did also note that a mirror order would be a sufficient safeguard if such an application were to come back in the future. Um, an added dimension to this case um, was the problems that the court found with QLRs, which is a theme that we'll come back to um, later on in this webinar, as it's been a feature of some of the case law recently. Um, a QLR or a qualified legal representative had been ordered in this case, but the court had not been able to appoint one. Um, reference was made to the president's guidance on the QLR scheme. Um, and again, this is something that we'll return to as there has been further case law on this more recently. Thank you. Um, so just moving here um, into that line of case law that uh, I mentioned we we're going to be talking about um, earlier. Um, these cases concern removal of parental responsibility um, from fathers. And um, we're going back a little way, just so that we can see the run um, and how that um, has developed. So first case is um, F and M, uh, Mr. Justice Hayden finds um, that parental responsibility cannot be removed from a father who is married to the mother at the time of birth. So that contrasts um, with the position for an unmarried father because section four of the Children Act specifically permits that parental responsibility um, to be revoked. Um, and Mr Justice Hayden, although um, he said that he found this profoundly uncomfortable in modern society, um, was quite clear that it was the case. Um, and um, he noted that protection could be afforded by prohibited steps and specific issue orders. And we can come on to in a moment what those orders um, might look like. In fact, having said that, I'll deal with it now. Um, so the order that um, Mr Justice Hayden made um, in this case was a prohibited steps order, and it was in these terms in case um, that uh, that is needed by you. It's in the judgment. Um, so no steps which could be taken by this father in meeting his responsibility for the children of any kind shall be taken by him without the consent of the court. So quite straightforward order, quite effective, um, as one could see, and emphasises the fact that Section 9114 can also play a role as a filter 
um, in relation to any applications that may come seeking that consent um, to have a say um, in whatever the um, question of the child's welfare um, is. So, uh, and I've just referenced at the bottom um, two other cases um, to look at in respect of removal of parental responsibility um, on that topic. Um, one from the President um, and one from uh, Ms Justice Russell as well. Um, the next case of particular interest, though, um, is Re A. Um, this was a um, decision of the Court of Appeal. Um, it was the case that um, the mother was attempting to terminate the parental responsibility of a married father, and it was her argument um, in the Court of Appeal that there ought, well, in the High Court and then in the Court of Appeal, there ought to be a declaration of incompatibility um, because the fact that she couldn't um, obtain recognition from the state that the children's father had acted in such a way that it justified the removal of his parental responsibility um, was not consistent with respect to um, her Article 8 rights and her Article 14 rights in that it discriminated against married mothers and the children of married parents. And the Court of Appeal, in a word, said no. Um, the drew together over quite a long period of the judgment threads which effectively say um, the difference in treatment between married and unmarried fathers is justified by the long-standing principle that married fathers and mothers should have irrevocable parental responsibility um, for their children. Uh, and that is really a historic review um, as such that leads to that conclusion. Um, but it is um, clear now that is the case. And that declaration was refused. Um, just a note um, to say, however, um, that um, in October last year, the government announced an intention to introduce legislation to remove parental responsibility from a parent who kills um, a partner with whom they share a child. And um, this space, as it were, will have to be watched to see if that um, is passed into law at any point. Um, the removal of um, parental responsibility following declarations of non-parentage, so-called, uh, following DNA testing, um, it, may be familiar with these two cases that um, were before the courts um, last year. Um, it's necessary to touch on them because um, they deal with an issue that um, does seem to arise, um, not entirely infrequently, more so in care cases, but there's no reason um, that the issue wouldn't arise within private law proceedings, and it's helpful to be aware of it. Um, where a father or purported father is named on the birth certificate, but it is shown by DNA testing um, taken for whatever reason that they're not in fact the father. And so there may be a general view or agreement even that their parental responsibility should be removed. There may be a dispute about that. The question is, um, what is the test to be applied if there is dispute about it? One probably doesn't need to worry as much if it's agreed. Um, and this is where there are the two conflicting judgments. So the first in re CNA um, from uh, his honour judge, Muradifer, but sitting as a section nine um, deputy high court judge, concluded that the court didn't need to consider a welfare analysis because the foundation for acquiring the parental responsibility is lost. And therefore, uh, it's effectively a simple matter of, of terminating it in line with the sort of reality of the situation. Um, and then we have um, two judgments, actually, of um, her on a judge case, one that predates re CNA and one that comes after it, um, where she determines in both instances that a welfare analysis um, is required. And she considers that she wasn't bound by the decision in re-CNA, despite um, it being determined by a Deputy High Court judge, um, because she was following authority um, from the Court of Appeal, um, Lord Justice Ryder in re-D, withdrawal of parental responsibility, who had previously considered um, that um, it was the welfare of the child that creates the presumption 
um, not the parenthood of the unmarried father. And therefore, she was of the view that it's a welfare based decision. Um, so that um, is a dichotomy as to what um, ought to be um, determined in those cases. But um, I'm sure authority will follow in due course to clear up the situation. Um, but that's as it stands at the moment. So now we move on to um, a crop of case law in relation to section 9114 orders. <clears throat> I should at this point state that there is another webinar in our series that has covered these orders. And so um, I will relatively quickly go through the case law and I would urge you to go and watch that webinar as well. Um, the first case we're going to be looking at is the case of A and B, a 2023 case. Um, by way of short background, um, there had been a first set of proceedings um, which had concluded in 2020 um, with a special guardianship order being awarded to the mother's friends, um, the mother having sadly passed away during proceedings um, with no direct contact awarded to the father. Um, the father then made a second application in June 2020, which was later not pursued as it transpired that the father had not undertaken um, a DAPP course, um, but an anger management course. Um, the case which we're dealing with here, the 2023 case, was therefore the father's third application for contact with the children. Um, a guardian was appointed to represent them, and the, the guardian applied to the court for a section 9114 order to prevent the father from making any further applications without first obtaining permission from the court. Um, the quotation that we've got on this slide um, and the next slide, um, these are from uh, paragraph 72 of the judgment, um, where the court provided a helpful summary on the approach to an application for a section 9114 order. Um, I don't intend to read out the quote in its entirety. Um, I understand the slides will be provided following the webinar. And again, um, it has been dealt with in a previous webinar in this series. Moving on then to the case of P and F, um, this was a case of Mr. Justice MacDonald. Um, in this case, a final child arrangements order um, for indirect contact and a section 9114 order had been made at a DRA. Um, the basis for appeal was that there were final orders which had been made in this case without the father having had the opportunity to dispute the CAFCAS report. Um, and it was clear from the transcript of the DRA hearing that the father did not consent to that final order being made in the terms that had been recommended by CAFCAS. Um, on appeal, it was found that the hearing had been in breach of the father's Article 6 rights, um, as the making of the final order at DRA deprived the father of the opportunity to not only present his evidence, um, but also his arguments um, against the CAFCAS report recommendations. Um, the court also determined in this case, and we're linking back to the section 9114 here, um, the court also determined that the section 9114 order had been made without the necessary procedural safeguards for a litigant in person. For example, the father was not given the opportunity to make representations with respect to the question of whether such an order should be made, and the judge also at first instance provided no reasons explaining why he had chosen to make the order for a period of two years. Um, last in this um, short section on section 9114 orders, um, this was an application for leave to make a child arrangements order application following a section 9114 order having been imposed in 2017. Um, the original judgment in this case had specified a number of steps that the father was expected to undertake before making any further applications, including obtaining a psychological report on his behaviour and functioning. He did obtain such a report, um, but permission was refused um, and this decision was appealed. And we have this case. Um, the court noted that there was not a proper hearing um, on the application for permission to for leave um or and there wasn't a fair process due to shortcomings in the technology and um, conduct of the remote hearing 
the court also considered um, that the court at first instance had applied the wrong test and should have considered whether there is a need for renewed judicial investigation based upon an arguable case. Um, the president, who, which this was before, noted that this is not a formidable hurdle to surmount. Um, in addition, uh, the court must now apply section 91A, subparagraph 4, um, in that the court must consider whether there has been a material change of circumstances uh, since the previous order was made. So what do you do when a section 9114 order is not enough? Um, we have to look elsewhere, so outside of the Children Act and into the family procedure rules, probably not um, rules that we are that familiar with. Um, it is FPR 4.8, but more importantly, Practice Direction 4B, um, which focuses on um, extended civil restraint orders. But just to give you the full picture, the court has the power to make both a limited civil restraint order or an extended civil restraint order, depending on the circumstances. A limited order may be made where the parties made two or more applications which are totally without merit. That's the absolutely key phrase here, and you will be familiar with it for when um, applications for permission to appeal are turned down and certified as being totally without merit. Um, this is um, one of the uses for that certification. So where the court makes a limited civil restraint order, the party will be strained, restrained from making further applications in those proceedings without obtaining the permission of the judge. Um, and if they do, then those applications will be um, struck out. And there are some other consequences that can flow as well, um, including that if applications are repeatedly made, um, which are totally without merit, um, the um, decision to dismiss can be final with no right of appeal. Difference here, um, which is worth noting, is that where you have either form of civil restraint order, the application for permission, um, as in the section 9114 that Catrum was just talking about, has to be on notice. Whereas, of course, in section 9114, the court has some discretion as to how to organize that part of the process. Um, so that's limited orders. Um, moving on to the civil restraint orders, which is um, where our next um, case touches, they are available where a party has persistently made applications which are totally without merit. So an up the ante from two to persistently made applications. The consequences are wider in that um, the order can restrain that person from making applications in any court, family court, civil court, criminal court, even um, all the divisions um, concerning any matter involving or relating to or touching on um, the issues in proceedings. Um, and, and so it just contains your whole issue uh, and stops it being subject to any further proceedings. The other procedural aspects of it um, are the same. So move on to the case law uh, and then a little bit of advice on the topic. So um, this was a case of Her Honour Judge Roberts um, in REP last year. And the reason she came to using civil restraint order in this case was the repeated but meritless applications to vary or discharge non-molestation orders. Um, so there had been a section 9114 order, but that didn't prevent these applications being made because they weren't Children Act applications. Um, and so she made an order, an extended civil restraint order, um, preventing um, the litigant from making applications in the family court or county court um, for anything involving or touching on the Children Act proceedings um, without permission for a period of two years. Um, and so the advice really is, is that if you have um, a litigant who is causing real difficulties through repeated applications, when those applications are um, dismissed, if they're on notice, is to invite the court to certify them on each occasion as being totally without merit. 
And then those orders can be used in due course if needed to found the application for a civil restraint order. Um, and that can apply both to um, non-molestation order applications or any application that's dismissed um, and also on permission to appeal. Um, so it just gives a, a different route um, if needed to deal with applications outside um, of the Children Act. And now we move on to two relatively short cases, um, both dealing with the subject of fact findings within private children proceedings. Um, we start with Ms X and Mr Y, a 2023 case, Mrs Justice Leaven. Um, there's a significant factual background in this matter, which I don't intend to go into into too much detail. The, the relevant part is to say that um, the father in this case had been convicted of a coercive and controlling behaviour and had been sentenced to 30 months in prison. He was serving his prison sentence at the time of this hearing. Um, the court found that it was not necessary to conduct a fact-finding hearing on further allegations in light of the conviction and sentence that the court already had before it. Um, there was a reminder in this case that there is no right in the family court pursuant to Article 6 to cross-examine a witness pursuant to the Family Procedure Rules 22.1. Um, under the Family Procedure Rules, um, the court has the power to control the evidence in terms of the issues on which it requires evidence um, and also gives the court the power to limit cross-examination and obviously noted that there's no right, absolute right to cross-examine a witness in the family court. Um, there was also a reminder to advocates that cases should be listed with short and proportionate time estimates and that those time estimates should be focused on the issues in the case and not the time that the advocates wish the case to take. Um, then we move on to the case of TRC and NS, the 2024 case. Um, this was dealing with the necessity and proportionality of fact findings again. Um, a decision taken by magistrates to vacate a fact-finding hearing was not wrong um, on the basis that the father had made admissions prior to that hearing and there was enough evidence for Kafkas to base their reports on. Um, Mrs Justice Leaven commented in this case that um, binary findings of fact largely emerged from public law cases and um, have been imported into private law cases. And in private law, it may well be that issues of the factual matrix and welfare issues are closely bound up and best considered together. Um, so sticking with, um, oh, sorry, is this your one? Um, I've jumped ahead. No, that's all right. <laughs> Um, so then we've got the case of RE-T, and um, this was in relation to non-disclosure of information to a party in the case. Um, there had been findings made in, in previous proceedings um, that the father was coercive and controlling. Um, taking part of the judgment, um, the judge found that he had a need to be consulted about everything intended to make mountains out of molehills. Um, the result of this finding had been that his contact was reduced from uh, reduced to sorry four nights per week per per fortnight um, and one evening during the week. Um, disagreements inevitably arose between the parties, with matters getting significantly worse in October 2023 when the younger child uh, began to show acute distress and the mother ceased contact. Um, there was a hearing in December 2023 at, with, at which the mother had been permitted to withhold information from the father about the younger child's welfare. And of course, contact with, had ceased at this point. This was then appealed um, by the father on the basis that the judge's decision in December 2023 to withhold that information was not reached by a properly balanced process of evaluation or an application of the correct legal test. So the, the court in this 2024 case before the Court of Appeal noted that the approach to cases such as these is set out in RE-D, um, which is a 1996 case. I've not included the citation um, on there. Um, I've all, but what I have set out on the slide um, and the slide after this one is the six questions um, that 
the court indicated that courts should consider when asked to authorise uh, non-disclosure in the interests of a child. Um, I don't intend to read out this quote in full um, on the basis of, of time, mainly. Uh, again, these slides will be provided um, following the webinar. Um, in this case, the appeal was ultimately allowed and disclosure was authorised to the father um, with very specific limitations which were contained within the judgment. Thank you. Um, so, as I was saying, <laughs> but it wasn't my turn, um, sticking with um, procedural issues, um, these are um, two cases predominantly on the issue of privilege against um, self-incrimination. And you'll see, going back this bit of time, but again, put together um, just to um, understand the, um, the sequence. So, um, the first case is a uh, father's unsuccessful attempt to seek an order um, following a fact-finding hearing. Uh, findings have been made against him. And um, in the way of these things, he wanted to respond to those findings in order to progress his application for contact. Um, and um, what he sought was an order that any statement or admission made by him um, in relation to those findings should not, could not be disclosed to the police or to the CPS. So he couldn't be prosecuted if he admitted that the judge had got it right. Um, and which would, of course, um, it, in the normal run of things, be thought maybe to assist his application for contact. So he was refused at first instance by Mr Justice Hayden, uh, refused by the Court of Appeal, and then um, refused permission to appeal to the Supreme Court by both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. So he had the full run of trying on this. Um, and the truth of the situation was so um, succinctly put um, in this quote, the father is not seeking privilege not to incriminate himself, but a privilege to self-incriminate with absolute protection as to the consequences um, and the conclusion that that, of course, would be contrary to the sound administration um, of uh, justice. And those findings, in fact, um, were disclosed to um, the Home Office um, as well as the mother had sought um, in the case. So that was one attempt by um, one father to do something similar um, to the next case, which was a case of uh, Recorder Samuel's case. So in this case, uh, the father took a different tack. Again, findings made against him in a fact-finding hearing. He thought, it seemed, that he might want to respond to those findings, um, uh, but he had criminal prosecution pending. And so he sought an adjournment of the Children Act proceedings on the basis that um, he couldn't tell the court that he accepted the findings against him without risking incriminating himself and his admissions being made available to the ongoing criminal prosecution. So effectively saying, well, it's not fair because I can't admit that I've done these things without my admission being used against me in the criminal proceedings. And perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, that argument was not accepted um, by the judge, um, who said that his privilege against self-incrimination didn't prevent him from advancing his case in the normal way, including giving evidence or challenging the evidence of others. Um, he um, cannot be compelled to give evidence because it wasn't public law proceedings. Um, and um, that was a significant difference between these cases um, and in um, care cases. And so the adjournment not being in the best interest of the children, um, it wasn't allowed. But um, it was another attempt, really, at, at trying to do the same thing, which is to preserve the right to make admissions in family proceedings um, without putting oneself at risk in the criminal sphere. And those attempts have been quite firmly rejected so far. Um, and here we come on to uh, a case involving disclosure to the police. Um, this is the case of EBK and DLO, um, 2023 High Court. Um, in this case, the father was refused permission to bring contempt proceedings against the mother who had shown documents from private law proceedings uh, to an interested party. In this case, it was the West Yorkshire Police. 
Um, this case does include a useful and detailed consideration of the law on contempt relating to disclosure of documents from private law proceedings to the police. Um, the relevant provisions um, are found in the Family Procedure Rules um, 12.73 and 12.75 and the accompanying practice direction at 12G. Um, these provisions tell us that information relating to the proceedings may be communicated to a professional acting in furtherance of child protection. Um, for example, this includes a specialist police officer. Um, a judgment or order may also be communicated to a non-specialist officer for the purpose of a criminal investigation. Sticking with a similar theme, we have two cases on the slide dealing with disclosure to other public bodies. The first being disclosure to the Home Office. Um, following a lengthy fact-finding hearing, um, the court rejected the mother's case um, that she was a victim of domestic abuse perpetrated by the father. Um, and this was the same account she had been gi had given to the Home Office, um, which had formed an integral part of her successful asylum claim in this country. Um, in this case, the balancing exercise weighed in favour of disclosing the fact-finding judgment to the Home Office. And it was then a matter for the Secretary of State to decide what steps should be taken in relation to the mother. Um, then second on the slide is re Z another 2023 case. Um, the question here uh, for the court was whether a judgment in long running private law proceedings, which made findings of domestic abuse against a father um, who works as a social worker should be disclosed to his regulator. And you can see there in, in, the, in the title of the case, the regulator was Social Work England. Um, the case contains helpful guidance um, in which the duty to consider disclosure is placed on the court, um, and that's to avoid the need for a victim of abuse to draw the matter to the court's attention themselves. The court also indicated that for future applications, if disclosure is opposed, the court should consider inviting the relevant regulatory body to intervene disclosing to it some limited information to assist the regulatory body in determining whether they need to seek disclosure um, from the court. Um, I said earlier in this uh, presentation that we'd be coming back to the problem, I should say, of, of QLRs, and here we are. <coughs> Um, the case of Re Z, a recent 2024 case, um, and this was a decision from the president. Um, in this case, as is relatively common at the moment, a QLR had been ordered but not appointed, um, and the court had to question um, witnesses on behalf of both parties. Um, the president commented that the principal options facing a court um, where a QLR has not been appointed and we've reached a hearing at which evidence is being heard are likely to be um, a further adjournment in the hope that a QLR may be found, an adjournment to allow one or both parties to engage their own advocate or legal representation. Thirdly, uh, potentially reviewing the need for the vulnerable party to give oral evidence and be cross-examined. This also includes reviewing the need for there to be a fact-finding hearing in the proceedings. Uh, fourthly, um, the court may want to consider any other alternative means of avoiding um, in-person cross-examination between the relevant parties. And then fifthly, it suggests the court itself taking on the task of asking questions in place of the in-person party. Interestingly, um, the president in this judgment says that despite practice direction 3AB um, para 3.5, the court is not prevented from asking questions on behalf of a party if it considers that in the interests of justice, it must nevertheless do so. Also contained within this judgment, the Re-Z judgment, um, there's helpful guidance for judges who are embarking on the task of asking questions of a witness. Specifically within this judgment, um, there's no reference to the court cross-examining witnesses. It's always asking questions of a witness. Um, the president also provided some practical points on cases where a QLR has been appointed, 
including suggesting that a litigant should always have to provide their questions in writing, just in case, for example, a QLR isn't found on the day. And that brings us on to our last case, everyone's favourite topic, transparency. Um, again, this case from August um, of last year, um, but uh, really important, I think, to keep our focus on what transparency means and what the rights of members of the press are um, in attending hearings, um, partly um, because um, of the capacity of judges to get it wrong, as demonstrated in this case, and partly um, because it happens so little that uh, we may not have those principles to the top of our mind to assist a judge on the day, as in this case, where um, a journalist um, sent a request, as they're entitled to do, um, for the link for um, the remote hearing, and the judge effectively um, just refused it or treated it as an application and refused that application um, and was not um, assisted particularly in respect to the state of the law um, by the advocates who um, probably um, hadn't dealt with many of these types of applications, it would be fair to say. So, um, the judge didn't deal with it correctly, and it came before Mrs Justice Leaven um, to decide. And she, in the case, gives an extremely helpful summary of the state of the law, of the principles that need to be applied, and things that we must remind ourselves that we need to be aware of when a journalist turns up at court uh, uh, and puts us off uh, by asking to come in or asking to see documents. Um, so the firstly to say um, that members of the press and legal bloggers are entitled to attend um, hearings um, and can only be excluded where it's necessary in the interests of the child, um, the safety or protection of the party or others, or the orderly conduct of proceedings. Um, it will be rare to be that it's appropriate for the court to inquire why a journalist is seeking to report or how they became aware um, of the hearing. Um, and in determining whether um, the reporter can report on what they see and hear, the court has to strike the balance between articles eight and 10. Um, so those are the sort of starting principles um, with it. Um, and that balancing act is really um, what's at the heart of deciding um, if the general rule um, that, um, that the press can attend ought to be um, excluded and then what, um, if anything, ought to be um, restricted in terms of reporting. And the case emphasises the um, public interest in reporting cases in the family court, which has obviously only been increasing in recent times, as we're told um, frequently, but is also apparent from reading the press. Um, and um, the views um, of the parties and the child may be of significance in deciding whether to allow reporting as opposed to attendance at the hearing um, by the press, but they will not um, be determinative because, of course, the public interest has to be weighed as well. Um, and so it's an excellent case, um, along with the Rule 27.11, um, to start with if um, you do have a member of the press um, attending court, or even if your client tells you um, that they've asked a member of the press to attend court, um, oh. which may happen also. Um, so that brings us to the end um, of our sort of highlights, I suppose, for the last um, year, perhaps, of case law um, in the private law sphere. I think I can safely um, turn on to our last slide, which asks if there are any questions, because I have checked and there are none. Um, so really, it just falls for me to thank you all for um, coming along. And if you're watching on video for that as well, um, for uh, me to remind you that recording will be made available shortly, um, along with um, the notes and that our Public Law Children series is starting on the 25th of April. That's a Thursday again at 5 p.m. And Joe Porter from the Public Law team will be discussing uh, supervision orders and asking the question, are they worth the paper that they are printed on? So thank you very much again and um, good evening. <laughs>